Um, well, welcome back, everybody. Um, we are going to hear two cases this afternoon. They're both mini oral arguments on the application. The first one is Legion London versus the Surgical Institute of Michigan and Kevin Crawford. Um, this is, as I said, a 15 minute argument per side. Um, Ms. Mazaron, you may attempt to uh, uh, reserve some of that for rebuttal, but we know, you, you know we like you to try and do that yourself. So we, we uh, wish you luck and you may proceed if you are ready. Yes, good afternoon, Your Honors. Mary Masseron on behalf of the defendant's appellants. I plan to reserve four minutes for rebuttal. May it please the court, reversal is required because the plaintiff may not substitute an entirely new affidavit of merit from a different doctor in a different specialty and call it an amendment so that it relates back to the original. Under the guise of interpreting court rules, the Court of Appeals majority judicially rewrote the Michigan legislature's tort reform substantive policy choices requiring early affidavits of merit from qualifying experts. Neither the Court of Appeals nor this court can arrogate to itself the power to unravel a key element of the legislature's tort reform plan without threatening their credibility as a, uh, objective arbiters of the law the legislative approach was predicated on the view that lawyers are making too much money and injured victims are not getting compensated as much as they should. The legislature put together a very careful plan providing balance and safeguards. And one of which was that an affidavit would be sufficient if the lawyer reasonably believed that it, the experts matched. It's not this court's role to interpret court rules to protect lawyers from the consequences of unreasonable conduct. If a lawyer files an affidavit of merit from the wrong expert when it is unreasonable to do so, the plaintiff presumably has a cause of action against the lawyer. The court should not revive a medical malpractice suit to avoid that consequence. As the court recognized in Bates, the legislature's reasonable belief standard affords some leeway, but it is not unbounded. Yet the Court of Appeals majority opinion provides essentially unbounded leeway by the back door of allowing entirely new affidavits to be filed at any time in the proceedings. Plaintiff's counsel did not reasonably believe that his original affidavit of merit expert, a neurosurgeon, was qualified. Dr. Crawford specializes in and is board certified in orthopedic surgery, which was disclosed to plaintiff's attorney. In the defendant's response to the notice to intent before the suit was filed, thus it's hard to imagine how one could argue that could ever be reasonable. The Court of Appeals majority has done violence to the language and the rules, upset the legislative plan and balance, and created a serious constitutional issue based on separation of powers. Ms. Mazur, let me let me interrupt you and see what questions folks have. So, sure. Yeah. Um, Justice Kavanaugh. I don't have any at this time. Justice Welch. Yes, uh, thanks. Uh, Ms. Mazaron, um, I do just have one. Um, I know one of the arguments made is that allowing um, the amendment here is, you know, can uh, impact substantial rights of your client. Um, what I'm wondering is, we obviously allow amendments in other contexts, so, you know, um, as far as a complaint, um, and we allow amendments that are actually pretty broad um, that can really change the theory of the case. And in this instance, that didn't happen. Um, yes, a different document was filed, uh, labeled an amendment, um, but really how were your client's rights impacted by that change? Because this requirement of the early exchange of information at the very outset of the suit is absolutely key to the legislative plan, which is a substantive plan to allow both parties at the very outset of the litigation to understand from qualifying experts the strength or weakness of their case so that they can make informed decisions about settling or take other appropriate action 
as they see fit, but with the light of that, that information. The entire legislative plan for tort reform with respect to the qualifying affidavits and the filing of them at the outset of the litigation was predicated on the legislature's belief that this information was important. It's not really the same as amending a complaint. And I think that although there are some similarities that <clears throat> that distinction of this legislative plan is what makes the difference. This court has said that the um, qualifying experts provision that those statutes affect substantive rights. And it's done that both in the Ligon decision and in McDougall years ago. So I think that issue has been resolved. And, and then this court took the step of um, filling in some gaps, providing for some timing provisions and other provisions in the rules. Some people thought that was affecting substantive rights, but it certainly was a defensible argument to make and position for the court to take to do that. But this is pushing that of one course, step in, further. In this instance, um, the affidavit that was amended was essentially almost the same affidavit, wasn't it? It was, I understand it was signed by a different medical professional, but essentially it was the same, wasn't it? Well, the words are not the same, but what's most important is the, the signer is not the same. An affidavit is the, the, the sworn testimony of the signer based on that signer's knowledge and information and belief. And so you can't, put another person's name on the bottom of that and just say, oh, well, this is the same. It's a substitution. It doesn't do any of the things that the traditional definition of amendment would, would contemplate doing, which is to, to modify, delete, or add something. It wholesale changes <laughs> the affidavit um, from one expert in a qualifying area with a standard of care that is based on orthopedic surgery and another expert with a standard of care that is based on a um, specialty of neurosurgeons. So those are not the same. Okay, thank you. Justice Zara? No questions at this time, thank you. Justice Viviano? No questions, thank you. Justice Bernstein? Counsel, good morning, welcome to the court. I, I want to follow up on Justice Welch's line of questioning. And again, you know me, my mantra is I like to keep things simple. And I believe that at the end of the day, the law must always make sense. So I'm just going to ask a kind of a simple question, but it kind of goes to the heart of your argument. What if the affiant dies or they retire or they're no longer practicing? Seems to me if, if a lawyer reasonably believes that the, the, the um, specialist is the correct specialist and that specialist files an affidavit, that affidavit stands even if that um, person who signed it dies because it's sworn testimony. That's what an affidavit is. It doesn't stop being that person's sworn testimony merely because the person has died or becomes unavailable. It would mean at trial, presumably, there would have to be either reliance only on that or there would have to be some other expert in that testimony. But I don't think that creates a problem. You say you like it simple. And I, I was thinking about this a little bit in response to one of the arguments that opposing counsel has made, which is that I'm asking the court to create a judicial exception to the rule because the rule doesn't specify it can't be a substitution. But it, that limit is in the nature of the word amendment. The word amendment carries with it the limit of its meaning. And I thought of a, an example, if, if you say, here's a, a horse race, this is a race for horses, 
And I come and I say, I have a zebra or a cow or a gazelle and they're going to race. You would say, no, there's no special language saying you can't have a horse or a zebra or a gazelle or a cow. The word horse has that limit. Well, the word amendment can't be stretched endlessly. It, it implies a limit. What it means is you're putting in an addition or a deletion or a correction of some of the language to, to change and fix some problem with it. That's not the same as a wholesale substitution, which we have here. No, and I understand your argument, but I, I think the essence of basically what would happen if, you know, out of this perspective is you just better pray that this person, you better use a young, healthy person because otherwise you're going to have some challenges. It just seems as though that's, that, that's just my concern, right? Like looking at this commonsensically, you know, it, it, it doesn't leave any room for error, right? Better make sure that your guy is young. You better make sure he's in good shape, good health, and you better make sure that nothing happens to him. I'm not aware of any law that would say because the person who properly signed an affidavit of merit in the correct legal specialty dies between when that is signed and some later time that that provides a basis for um, dismissing the lawsuit. And I would be frankly surprised if a court would say that. Counsel, thank you very much. Justice Clement. No questions, thank you. Ms. Mazarin, I know you want to reserve four minutes, but let me just um, push a little bit on what, you know, I, the, the definition of amendment, which isn't in the statute. And, you know, I, it feels a little bit in the eye of the beholder to me, because I could imagine saying, Basically, the only change that happened here was the name of the doctor. No, no change that really affected your client's ability to defend the suit, you know, took place. So that might feel more like a small change or an amendment than um, adding a theory of liability or, you know, um, a, a new way of, of uh, that you'd have to defend against the case. So wh why should we understand substituting the name of a doctor not to be an amendment? Because the, it's not substituting the name. If you think about what is an affidavit, an affidavit is an attestation, a sworn statement by a person. And in this case, it's not only that, that, that difference, but most importantly, when the legislature passed the statute requiring this matching of experts, it did so because it wanted to be sure that the experts who were providing testimony in medical malpractice came from the same specialty, the same board certification, the same subspecialty, and the legislature wanted to be sure they were practicing in that area. That was an important part of the reform to get away from bought and paid for expert testimony, which we'd all like to say didn't exist, but we know from the real world that it did exist. And that was one of the problems that was being addressed. The legislature wanted this very precise matching to be sure that the standard of care, which varies, and we know this as lawyers, a tax lawyer's standard of care would be different than a generalist appellate lawyer's standard of care or a family law standard of care. That's why we turn work down when it's outside of our area of expertise. But that, that might make sense if the new um, if the new affidavit just you know identified a whole different standard of care and really, you know, changed things for your client, but because it didn't, and it just changed the name of the doctor, it sounds, feels more like just a amendment or like a modification. I, I don't think you can change the signer to an affidavit and call that merely a modification. I don't think you can. And that coupled with the change in the standard of practice 
if you look at the two affidavits in the record, they are not identical. There is differences. And I think those differences in part speak to the standard of practice for an orthopedic surgeon who was assisting versus a neurosurgeon. And that is why the second affidavit, I think, is significantly shorter. And there are a number of items on it that were not on the first affidavit. Now, obviously, the wording is different. Thank you. That's helpful. All right. Let me let you at least reserve a little bit of time. Okay. Okay. Mr. Bendur. Thank you. May it please the court, Mark Bendur, on behalf of Plaintiff Appley. I find it interesting that the defense suggests that the word amendment in law means something rather insignificant or a minor change. And I suspect that would come as quite a surprise to people who go to church or synagogues or mosques or other places of worship under the protection of the First Amendment, or that the concept of due process found in the Fifth and Fourteenth Amendment is really nothing significant. I mean, I think those examples of what the word amendment can mean in the law are pretty telling and put to, uh, to rest the defense argument that the same word amendment or amend in the context of these court rules means something different th than uh, any type of change. All amendments change. To say that this is something new adds nothing to the uh, discussion because all amendments by definition create something new. The idea that there are two grossly different standards of care it is quite remarkable in the context of this case, where we have two surgeons, both being members of groups that claim to specialize in spinal surgery, performing the exact same surgery on the exact same patient at the exact same time, where one of them does something that lands himself in federal prison for 19 years, and the other doctor thinks that it's fine and dandy, and it's okay for a, uh, an orthopedic surgeon to engage in the same conduct. And when we get to the question of ample notice, the NOI has already gone out. That describes what the allegations are. The two affidavits describe the allegation. The defendant knows what he did. He knows whether what he did was right or wrong. All that the, the name change does is add a different name to an affidavit, which is going to do nothing more than verify that there is medical support for the substantive allegations of malpractice. There was a doctor who was prepared to put his name to that affidavit, who specialized in spinal surgery, or at least uh, one of the subspecialties that uh, specialize in spinal surgery. Um, Mr. Bindor, let me interrupt you and see what sure. questions people have. Um, Justice Kavanaugh. No questions for me. Justice Welch. Yes, uh, thanks, Mr. Bindor. I do have a question. One of the um, issues that has been raised is that the statute here does require you know, a reasonable belief as to the right. actual qualifications. So if we accept your argument, does that nullify that provision of the statute? Does it matter anymore? No, that if, if there was a reasonable belief, and, and this was one of the issues the Court of Appeals didn't have to deal with because of the reason uh, of their are because of their decision. But if there is a good faith belief, there's compliance with the statutes and there's never any need to amend in the first place. The amendment process itself assumes that there has been an error and it has failed to meet the statute, which would be met by reasonable belief. So they are really, uh, one is, I guess, a legislative uh, limitation. An amendment is the judicial way of dealing with a mistake, an error that doesn't satisfy the statute. 
And to say that to add good faith into the uh, mix, to say that you have to have a good faith, reasonable belief, would destroy the amendment altogether because if you had that, you wouldn't even need to amend. You would satisfy the statute. Thank you. Justice Zara? No questions. Thank you. Justice Viviano? Uh, no questions. Thank you. Justice Bernstein? No questions. Thank you. Justice Clement? No questions. Uh, Mr. Bindor, it, it does, uh, Ms. Mazaron's point has sort of an intuitive appeal, right? It feels like you, you have an affidavit with one uh, doctor with one specialty, and then you have a completely different affidavit with a different doctor in a different specialty. Where, where, how, how should we think about the, the line around what's an amendment and what's not an amendment? It's something else. And what is that something else? Um, I, I mean, I think that the term amendment is by its nature broad and unlimited. Now, certainly the court could change the court rule and say an amendment that does this is allowed and an amendment that does something else is not allowed. But we're not talking about a statute. We're talking a court rule right now. And I, I think we prevail under all the principles of construction that we have spoken to. And we've briefed that. I'll be glad to address it if it's a problem. But as a matter of construction of court rules, um, we prevail. The court rule is quite clear that the uh, 2.118 amendment can include amendment of affidavits. Uh, the other rule, 2.112, speaks of, of challenges to the qualifications of affiants. So uh, the language seems to me quite clearly to encompass a change of this nature, that remedies an error with regard to the specialty or the qualifications of the affiant. And again, remember in this particular case, what I think is so unique is that you have something that according to the legislature are two different specialties, but indeed they are both specialties that encompass surgery of the spine. And what we have is uh, a doctor who has joined a different named group of spinal surgery specialists. And I understand that that's sort of the outgrowth of the statute, but it does create something that is amenable to uh, a remedy, a judicial remedy. And if I can speak briefly to the notion that this rule somehow undermines the statute, it doesn't. Nobody's asking this court or the Court of Appeals to interpret a statute other, other than the reasonable belief that fell by the wayside. We're asking to deal with a court rule. And it's also, I think, significant that the statute does not have its own uh, remedy for imperfection. Contrast, for example, the Elliott Larson statute, which says an employer shall not do this. And then goes on to say, if it does, you've got a cause of action, you've got a right to trial by jury, here are the damages you can collect, you can collect statutory attorney fees, and it's got an entire list of, of remedies for noncompliance. In contrast, this statute has the obligations of uh, meritorious defense and this and that and the other thing but it doesn't say what the consequences of imperfection are. And it's not at all a, an intrusion on legislative rights for this court to fulfill its constitutional role as the guardian of the system of justice that is designed to reach outcomes based on the merit rather than ultimately insignificant technicalities. So, so I, I think... It, it's misguided to say that the statute uh, somehow prevents this court from addressing what are the consequences of imperfection. Um, 
when counsel talks about the early exchange, that's fine. But we have that here. We have the NOI, which is really what the merits are all about, and the complaint, which tell them exactly what the complaints are. All the affidavit of merit does is say, yep, there's a doctor out there who thinks this is a legitimate claim. It's not frivolous. And certainly you have that. Now, one more thing that might be added in perhaps going to your question about what type of amendments, there is under 600.2301, the, uh, if the circum, it, it, it does allow some judicial discretion in egregious cases. I think the defense has suggested that uh, with the Court of Appeals decision, somebody can just file a, a completely irrelevant affidavit as a place saver, if you will. Well, I mean, I, I can't see anyone in their right mind doing that. Um, <laughs> there's no benefit to be gained by it unless you want to say that you're down to the last day and you can't find an expert. So, you know, you, you get a podiatrist to say that it was a bad cardiac care. Um, but, but in the real world, I think um, that's quite fanciful and not what was intended or uh, to be worried about. Um, and of course, this is a two-edged sword. Um, I can recall a case back in the, the days of unforgiving enforcement where the defense affidavit was bad. And it was a case I actually prevailed on behalf of the plaintiff. I didn't like to. It's like, if you're going to use unjust <laughs> rules, they cut both ways. But there's still a stench to it when you win that way. And, and I think that was what the court rule was designed to correct. And I think by its language, it does so. And it does so in a very intelligent and straightforward way. Um, and I'll be glad to address any other questions, but I think that in the brief kind of wraps up our position. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Vendor. Does anyone have any additional questions for Mr. Vendor? Okay, Ms. Mazaron, you have a little bit of time. Thank you. A couple of points. As Brother Council said, the plan of the legislature does cut both ways, and it should. It is all designed, though, with the view that tort litigation in the medical malpractice area is extremely expensive and that the early exchange of, of uh, information, specific information by qualified experts would facilitate not just weeding out the weak cases, but settlement of and avoiding litigation costs of the strong cases. And that's the legislature's policy choice, not mine, not brother councils, not this courts. And if you listen to the arguments and read the arguments uh, in both the uh, brief by the plaintiff and the Michigan Association of Justice and the argument given this morning, the view of amendment that is being advanced is so broad that it would encompass any change at any time up to final judgment. That completely guts the entire tort reform package. And because of that, it seems to me it goes too far. Um, finally, this court has already said in Bates, an ophthalmologist is not the same as a, an optometrist. I think that completely refutes the argument that the orthopedic surgeon is the same as a neurosurgeon. Are there some overlapping aspects of body parts that are involved in what they do? Yes. Is that enough to call it the same? No. And that's what this court said in Bates. Um, the consequence of this imperfection rationale in the legislature not saying a specific remedy for, for a wrong outcome allowed this court to fill some gaps. Some people thought that was going beyond and intruding into the legislative policy choices, but this court entered timing provisions intended to assure that challenges were brought early on to avoid um, people 
lying in the weeds and waiting till the statute has had gone. But what's being asked here goes well beyond that and would surely mean that the statute will have no impact at all. And as this court has recognized it at least twice as being substantive, embodying substantive policy choices, it seems to me a reversal is required and a reinstatement of the trial court's decisions for the reasons the trial court set forth, as well as those in the dissent. I'm Thank happy to answer questions. I'll see, do, do, does anyone have follow-up questions for Ms. Mazarin? Okay, thank you very much, both of you. The case will be submitted.